I'm Dr. Nikki Kay, delighted to be back. Um, and we're going to be discussing today how hormones vary over the lifespan and how this might affect uh, your training. You're listening to the Physical Performance Show. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, brought to you by Endure IQ's online long course triathlon courses and Pogo Physio. I'm Brad Beer, sports physiotherapist and exercise scientist by trade and training and founder of Pogo. Each week, we'll bring you the latest and greatest information and inspiration designed to help you perform at your physical best. And of course, we do this across a range of different episodes, interest editions, expert editions, featured performers and coaches corners. And coming off the back of last week's featured performer episode with the queen of ultra running, Camille Heron, it's time to jump back over with an expert edition. And as you heard at the top of the show, we are revisiting the one and only Dr. Nikki Kay for part two of an exploration around all things hormone health and performance. This time with Dr. Nikki Kay, we'll explore the hormones for both male and female endurance athletes across the lifespan. Now, if you missed episode 193 with Dr. Nikki Kay, please jump back and enjoy the full learnings from that episode. It was so well received at the time, just over a year ago, and it was a deep dive into all things athletic health and performance. And one of the big takeaways from part one with Dr. Nikki Kay was that we can do all the training we like under the sun. However, at the end of the day, it is our hormones which drive the recovery and adaptation process to that training. So that was episode 193. And with 12 months of time since we last caught up, it's time to extract more learnings from Dr. Nikki Kay. Now, by way of bio, Dr. Nikki Kay is a sports and dance endocrinologist with 20 years of extensive clinical and research experience in working with professional ballet dancers and elite athletes. At the time of recording, Dr. Nikki Kay is consulting for both Scottish Ballet and also Manchester United, whilst also consulting privately and serving as the Chief Medical Officer for Fourth Edge on hormone profiling. Nikki is currently working to monitor female athlete menstruation cycles through athlete management systems to reduce female athletes' injury risk. She's a published author of numerous scientific articles, provides regular reviews for the British Journal of Sports Medicine, and is a go-to expert when it comes to the risks of energy deficiency in sports and the female athlete. Her published medical research includes the effects of training and nutrition on the endocrine system and body composition, along with bone mineral density. Nikki's an honorary fellow of the Department of Sport and Exercise Sciences at Durham University, a member of the British Association of Sport and Exercise Medicine and the National Institute of Dance, Medicine and Science. And during today's expert edition, you'll enjoy learnings around how to optimise our hormones as both male and female athletes across our lifespan and around our sports. Nikki shares around key concepts for both the pre, peri and post menopausal female athlete and also the male athlete when it comes to monitoring and maximizing, legally that is, testosterone levels. So get ready with your pen and paper. Here is my conversation with Dr. Nikki Kay on all things hormone health and performance part two, hormones across the lifespan. Dr. Nikki Kay, welcome back to the Physical Performance Show for your return and uh, there's been a lot happening in the world since we spoke uh, almost a year ago now. Yeah, listen, thanks for inviting me back. And you're absolutely right. Lots of things, uh, unfortunate things out of our control happening. So I guess this is, you know, it's been tough for everybody, but especially for exercises, athletes, dancers, whose training's been 
and then competition and performances are, you know, uncertain. So, um, yeah, it's it's great. So thanks again for having me back and look forward to having another exciting discussion. <laughs> Well, the expert edition we recorded uh, last time, Dr. Nikki, it uh, has been incredibly popular because the, the, this show is all about the learnings, the highs, lows and learnings. And uh, there were many learnings to be had from uh, coaches, practitioners and athletes uh, from that expert edition. And the theme that we thought would be wise to explore today was how hormones uh, can affect individuals across the lifespan with specific attention around an exercise in individual. Shall we just recap where we were the last episode around this? I've actually incorporated with credit to Dr. Nikki K into the uh, presentations I, I give to physios around uh, running injuries. And I've incorporated your integrated periodization triangle at some, in oh, my right. slides, yes, exactly. with your credit right. there, of course. Can you just Thank refresh you. us around the concept of that integrated periodization concept and what, what it's all about. The things that we can control in, in this strange world are um, trading load, nutrition and recovery. And I think it's really important, uh, in my opinion, when people are talking about their training schedule, um, they often are just thinking literally of the time they are exercising, but actually that would be a big oversight if that in within that training schedule you haven't got intentional schedules in uh, rest days polarized training of course i get told off by my coaching son for being such an age group person and always doing his training in the gray zone i always do the same session i admit it now sorry i'm not a good example you know we should of course give the body different looks at the different types of exercise definitely uh, recovery and nutrition really really vital there's no point uh you know you will pump up the tires on your bike if you went out for a ride and you would check your equipment i would check my ballet shoes are all there and everything so why wouldn't you sort of do a mental check that you've fueled sufficiently for whatever the particular training session you're going to do and refueling afterwards so yeah those are the three uh cornerstones the tripod is the most stable structure apparently i'm not an engineer but so you know those three uh factors are super important and the point is if you get all those in a nice balance then leading into the hormones uh you're going to be your hormones will be very happy and you need to respect your hormones because they are the things that are driving your adaptations to exercise so and you can control your hormones to a certain extent through those three types of behavior. So that's really why it's so uh, important in my opinion. And it's just such a, a beautiful, and we'll pop up uh, the integrated periodization triangle in the show notes uh, for those that need the, the graphic, but it's, it's such a, a beautiful and simple example of, of considering all these factors for the health of our hormones. And I recall on the last episode, Dr. Nikki, you shared, of course, the training gives us the adaptation but the hormones are the thing that allows us to absorb or, or put to work that, that training uh, adaptation. They, they are the thing that controls it. So Yeah, yeah, they drive it. Exactly, exactly. So it, well, you don't actually get fitter while you are running or, or cycling. It's actually in the recovery afterwards, um, if you take it on your recovery fuel, of course, um, that the hormones will spring into action growth hormone for example is very important uh, and that's that's released when you're asleep for example that's why recovery is so important the two main stimuli for growth hormone release are exercise and sleep so you're actually getting fitter when you're asleep sounds weird doesn't it but um that is that's why it's so crucial to get those three things all as a package together dr k uh Shona Halson, recovery science expert who has that uh, beautiful mm -hmm. phrase, the only training that we are benefiting from is the training that we are recovering from. And when you think about it through that lens, it's like, okay, wow, this exactly. recovery. I exactly agree with her. Yeah, she's done some fantastic work and I absolutely uh, agree. Um, you get fitter when you're asleep, provided you, of course, you've done the training beforehand. Yes, of course, and fuel properly, but you don't just get fitter asleep. But you have to balance it. That's why I, I, you know, said that I think lots of people overlook that. They think that training, a training schedule is only literally the physical activity part of it. So, um, you know, and especially at, at various ages, this becomes even more important. The young athletes, they shouldn't be overtraining, of course. Uh, 
uh, you know, they're going to burn out early and they've got lots of other energy demands and, of course, academic demands from school and whatever. And also, uh, unfortunately, as we get older, <laughs> like me, uh, you know, it happens to us all that, you know, our body isn't quite, uh, it's not the same as a 20-year-old, shall I say. We haven't got the same hormone levels as a 20-year-old. So, of course, we have to give the hormones more of a chance and therefore recovery actually becomes even more important. We need to take that into account that our needs and change as we pass through life and on your triangle there is that reflection that it's a, it's a spectrum from uh ideal behaviors on those three points of the triangle mm -hmm. the training loads nutrition and recovery from getting it right through to not getting it right and uh if we think about that across the lifespan i mean obviously we've got male and females uh, mm -hmm. you've mentioned uh this process of hormone profiling i think most people listening in would intuitively grasp what that might mean as the doctor can you share what this hormone profile is and why it matters um well on a very broad sweep just going through the uh you know the various stages in the lifespan obviously as um a teenager as a youngster you've got a really rapid growth spurt um so of course the growth hormone is super high um and then you've got puberty when the sex steroid hormones, you know, the testosterone in, 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 the, in the men and the menstrual cycles in the women, hopefully will start. If we just, I'm just giving a broad sweep now. So basically growth hormone has a, sp a, sp a spike then and then in the young years, but then it will still remain, we, growth hormone, it's not just for growth. <laughs> it's for uh, body composition. So it will change during the lifespan and unfortunately gradually decline, particularly as we get, you know, older, 40, 50s, it does start going down, which is why recovery becomes so important. In terms of the other key hormones, um, testosterone for men re remains relatively stable, just gradually down. Uh, and yes, it does slightly decline, you know, 40s, 50s, starts going down. But I'm sorry, guys, newsflash, women do have it tougher, it's true. Because if you look at the profile for Estrogen, for example, one of the, f the key female hormones for, for bone health, for example, estrogen levels pretty much exactly reflect what your bone mineral density does as a woman. It, goes it increases rapidly to reach peak bone mass, early 20s, remains relatively stable, maybe a little gradual, gradual slip down, but then unfortunately, um, estrogen takes a real nosedive at the menopause because menstrual cycles stop. So that's a broad sweep across the lifespan. So one scale looking at your hormones, hormone profiling is over your life, literally, to do some blood tests at various points in your life so you can see what's going on. But more specifically, the hormone profiling that um, I've recently been researching and working on is for the female. And this is within a uh, sort of the segment of her life when uh, she will be having uh, menstrual cycles. I mean, I think last time, uh, Brad, we spoke a lot about the warning signs if women's periods switch off, Correct. if you're not fueling correctly and then the hormones downregulate, switch off. But actually, as we discussed, that is, that's not great. <laughs> that's not normal. Normal physiology is as a woman, you will have regular menstrual cycles from the age you start to the age you know, they stop at the menopause and all the hormones take a nosedive. So hormone profiling, we can also look in uh, particular shorter time frames. And that's what I was also thinking about over the menstrual cycle to see what your hormones are doing. Looking at, you know, female uh, athletes uh, said here, it's looking at what's happening whilst they are having menstrual cycles. Obviously, last time, as you pointed out, we spoke about uh, the absence of the menstrual cycle and what that means to likely being under fueled, et cetera, and the performance and health consequences of that state, rel relative energy deficiency in sport. As a doctor, what will you be tracking across? So what might you be measuring? Is it the, the different hormones at the different stages of the cycle relative to what they should be? And another question, if I can add on to that, uh, Dr. Nikki, is there an athletic range? So obviously there's the general mm -hmm. reference ranges and is there extra considerations for the high energy expender? Yeah, well, uh, in general, for, I'll start actually with that last question about, uh, you know, is the, are there athletic range, are there ranges, different ranges for, uh, you know, if you're training a lot? 
for certain things in the body, there is a very, very tight, narrow corridor. They should be in that range. Um, so uh, we also studied this many years ago when we were developing a, a doping test for growth hormone because growth hormone, as I said, is um, you know very uh, helpful for sporting adaptations. Just to underline, of course, not I'm and no way advocating doping, but. Suffice to say that 75% of doping offences are actually hormones. Anyway, so one of the questions was, is there a different range for athletes? Mm. Okay. Um, and yes, one can say that there might be a little bit uh, uh, higher if they are, you know, training a lot and, and they're recovering sufficiently, but it would not be in medical terms. It would still be within the range. Uh, because in as a, the range, you know, is the normal population range, right? And so um, they might be slightly off that Gaussian distribution, slightly off, uh, you know, higher, for example, than growth hormone. But that is not to say, and that's the whole point of the doping test. It's like, yes, okay, well, let, you know, if you're in the normal population range, maybe you are slightly outside that central band, or you're a bit higher or a bit lower, as it case may be. But it's still going to the board body, um, you know, it's, that's the physiology of the body. So if it's outside that range, a real absolute outlier, well, first of all, actually, it's concerning you might have a medical condition, right? Uh, or, yes, you might be doping, basically. But anyway, that's, that's the normal range idea. But going back to the females specifically for their cycles, um, maybe, Brad, we should just outline, just remind everyone about what the menstrual cycle is, do you think? Just say, so basically the menstrual cycle, because otherwise it's going to not make sense what I'm going to say next about the hormones. Um, uh, so just to sort of orientate everybody, if we just talk about a textbook menstrual cycle, typically it's a lunar month, 28, 29 days. Um, starting day one is the when your menstrual bleed starts. So that's day one. Then around about the midpoint, you ovulate, you, uh, you know, flick out an egg from the ovary. Uh, and then um, that midpoint or roughly midpoint, it's, it's very, slightly variable, but ovulation sort of divides the cycle into two parts. All the build up to producing uh, that egg for ovulation, that's called the follicular phase, because the follicle is where the egg is uh, being developed. Okay, so the first bit of the cycle is called the follicular phase when the eggs are ready to be ovulated and then after ovulation has occurred from then until the menstrual bleed that's called the luteal phase and the phases are you know dominated by certain hormones so the the four there are four key hormones am i going into too much detail by the way was this all right you think this is <laughs> this is brilliant and, and, and as you're explaining this uh, dr nikki i'm thinking of uh, this prior featured guest as, as a featured performer british compatriot of yours, Georgia Taylor Brown, who just won the uh, World Olympic, tri oh, sorry, the World Triathlon Championships. And Georgia mm -hmm. commented that she's now in her 20s, well into her 20s, and she's only just started to figure out the menstrual cycle. And it made yeah, you well, think. So, you know, say, so I don't think you're going into too much detail. Okay, fine. So, and also, by the way, um, I can give you a slide that people can see. Yes. Because this is such a beautiful choreography of female hormones. Uh, so I'm not trying to make turn everyone into, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> endocrine specialist here, but I'm just trying to, to explain as simply as I can, although it is complicated anyway, uh, by the nature of it, because I think number one, as a woman, it's important you kind of get an idea, you know, what's going on. And also, uh, you know, for a coach, if you're a coach, and you've got a woman saying to you, oh, actually, I'm feeling I'm not feeling so great in my luteal phase. Uh, you need to vaguely know <laughs> what they're talking about. So, yeah. so just to quickly go over what I've said so far, uh, the menstrual cycle typically is around 28 days uh, and it's divided into two halves. First half follicular phase, then you ovulate, and then after that is the luteal phase. And there's a set, sort of a set pattern of the fluctuation of hormones during that phase. So there are four female hormones you need to know about. There are two control ones, Okay, uh, FSH and LH, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone. They're controlled hormones. So to be absolutely honest, um, I'm just mentioning them because you might be wondering how is all this uh, system happening. And then the two response hormones released by the ovaries, 
are estrogen and progesterone. So I'm sure everyone's heard of estrogen and progesterone. And those are the ones that are really key because they're released from the ovaries and they, uh, there are receptors for those two hormones throughout the whole of the body. And so that's, those are the ones we're really talking about, the response hormones that are having an effect. So the first phase of the cycle during the follicular phase, it, it's sort of relatively low key. Estrogen levels are starting to increase because you're starting, the body's starting to get ready to ovulate the egg. And then the ovulation, there's a spike of the LH, the control hormone, and then the egg is released and the estrogen at that point is quite high. Then after you've ovulated, the next phase, the luteal phase, then um, we have the uh, predominance or the production of progesterone, okay? Estrogen is still relatively high, but, but progesterone goes quite high in that luteal phase. And then they all drop off uh, just before the menstrual bleed, the menstruation the, the period. And so if you think about it in that way, it kind of makes more sense that, during, of course, you might feel different during different phases of the cycle mm. because there is going to be this fluctuation in the hormones. Um, but women, listen, you know, some women, we should say, just go throughout life uh, and they have their menstrual cycles and it, you know, doesn't bother them really. You know, they don't notice any particular changes. Um, that's, that's just the way of it. Um, but some women, because of these vast fluctuations in the hormones, they do feel different. So the point of the hormone profiling that we're developing is to to exactly correlate how they're feeling with what their hormone levels are. Because it's all about empowerment, isn't it? It's all about understanding your data. So, you know, we have heart rate monitors, uh, we have power meters in the bike, uh, you know, all these various gadgets to monitor what we're doing. And so, you know, doing a blood test to see what your hormones are is just another part in that data collection process. And so then the woman can uh, correlate how she's feeling with what her hormone levels are at that particular time of the cycle. Um, so for example, typically women can feel not so great <laughs> during the luteal phase. And if, um, you know, I have an athlete or dancer who's saying, you know, I feel really, I feel really not great. I'm feeling, uh, I'm feeling really hot. I can't sleep well. I'm feeling a bit shamed, moody. Um, you know, I'm just uh, feeling hungry and want to eat chocolate all the time. Uh, and then I do the blood test and I say to her, yes, well, no wonder. It's because your progesterone, you have ovulated, it has gone quite high, come down quite low again. And that's why, and, and that is, that's great. I'm saying as a woman or as anybody to empower yourself to know I'm not going mad. There is a reason why I'm feeling like this. Mm. Uh, and then you can start to take steps to address that. Okay. So you can then make, I make suggestions, practical strategies, uh, you know, for uh, the athlete or dancer. So we're doing, so just to put this in context, we're doing this exact process that I'm talking about with Scottish ballet dancers. So they're all tracking their cycles. Um, so I know which phase of the cycle they're in at any time. And at any time, every day, they also are giving their wellness report, how they're feeling. Uh, and I'm doing the profiling I've just discussed. And then literally I've got a whole, um, you know, some graphs and things and I sit down with each of them and we go through it and we say, uh, for example, you said you were feeling really bad for these days. And yes, look, I can see that this is why your progesterone is high, for example. And I can say, right, how are we going to tackle this? Let's try this, this and this. So anything you suggest has to be um, based on obviously data collection you know, and a report from the athlete and also tailored to be, you know, uh, personalized for that person. Because I'd, like I say, there's no point in giving a, advice to a woman who isn't experienced any problems. She's like, well, I didn't even know I <laughs> didn't have those problems. So you see what I mean? You don't want to overload the person, but then that's how I, so that's exactly the, the, how I'm approaching it. I'm getting all the information uh, from the dancer. I sit down with each of them individually and just work out some personal strategies. Because the thing is, mind you, at the moment, there aren't any competitions or performances, but uh, you know, the thing is I can't change, or uh, no one can change. If they have a performance of Swan Lake starting here on this date, we can't change that, right? And their cycle, and then, you know, and then it's like, ah, oh, that does is going to coincide with when there's a pro problematic phase of the cycle for you. Because I got asked the other day, oh, well, what happens if that, um, phase falls on this, would you give them medication to stop their periods? It's like, absolutely not. 
you never want to give medication unless you have to, because frankly, what you should have done already, you should have been doing all this work already so that the dancer has her personal strategy. She's totally confident and feels confident. She knows what to do so that when she has to step on stage for that performance opening night, she has done everything. She's checked her point shoes, she's checked her costume, she knows the choreography, she practices the steps. She has also put in place whatever we have discussed, her personal strategies for dealing with that phase of the cycle, whatever it might be. So that was a very long, sorry, that ended up being quite long. But that's the gist of pro, um, hormone profiling. You can do it at various stages of your life just to see what's going on. But also for the woman especially, you can uh, look at you know uh, the segments of her menstrual cycles and see what's going on there. And as you said, uh, Dr. Nikki, it's all about correlating how the individual, the athlete, the performers feeling relative to their hormone levels, which will be driven by the stage of the cycle. And as you said, there's two predominant phases, if you like the high and low hormone phase. Um, and the implications are that if the athlete knows that one, they're empowered because they yeah. understand why they're feeling how they are. And then the sports physio in me can't help but think that greater empowerment will lead to better decisions and, mm -hmm. and potentially with less erroneous decisions around training or pushing themselves, et cetera, we may just see less mm -hmm. injuries. Yeah. And I think from, a, from the physio point of view, I think it's been recognized for some time that um, the risk of ACL injury, anterior cruciate ligament injury for the woman is just pre-ovulation when the estrogen is going high just before ovulation. And so again, knowing that, uh, the thing is that you can't, some of the elements of training you can't change. You know what I mean? You can't, you can't say, oh, I can't do that football training session because um, uh, you know, I'm at high risk of ACL. It, it, that's not possible. But the point is, like you said, it's, it's thinking ahead preventative. So for example, I went to uh, Barca when we could go to Spain. Um, and you know, I was speaking with the uh, physios there and saying, oh, uh, are you, what's happening with your ACLs? And they, and they sort of smiled at me. Uh, I can't do Spanish, but anyway, effectively they said to me, they don't get many injuries or they don't get those injuries because they know, they know that that is uh, a risk time for ACL injury. So guess what? All of theirs, they all, they've all done their strength and conditioning, proprioception work, uh, and, the, and the athletes are aware. Um, so of course they will still do the training that's being asked of them. Uh, you know, they don't say, oh, no, I can't go on the pitch today because of whatever, but they have done their whatever it is, their pre-activation work, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, so that's what I'm thinking from a practical point of view. I mean, do you, have you seen that um, much or aware of that about the ACL and women? Well, predominantly working with uh, individual athletes, endurance sports athletes, uh, not exposed to that at a team level, but... Uh... I had seen that cited uh, in the literature, so it, it would make no, it's, sense. No, it's true. I mean, especially for the ones where you're changing direction. The point is, as you and I know, and everyone listening will know, injuries happen, unfortunately. Yeah. We can't prevent, we can't stop all injuries. It's just not, you know, things happen. I snapped my ACL when I, it was my own fault skiing. I thought I could ski on one ski. It didn't work out. Anyway. <laughs> I realize I'm remembering the physics as I turned my leg with this long lever on my leg. It's like, ah, this is probably wasn't the best call. <laughs> so you know I mean? things, things happen, but obviously, you know, you want to be doing everything and understanding all the factors that could contribute to an injury to try and mitigate the risk as, as far as you, as possible. And even the psychology of the performer athlete or individual being, reassured that what they're experiencing is normal and less of a psychological load and because i think the thing is because every woman is very different some male coaches may not fully appreciate that again you don't want to be labeled as being some weird mad person that is just you know feeling really um really moody always during the luteal phase of the cycle and it's no it's not that you're some mad hormonal <laughs> person well you i mean it is your hormones it's natural but everyone is an individual so i think that's that's also helpful as you say empowerment so you as a woman know okay fine this is what it is i'm not going mad this is what's going on this is what i need to do about it and you sort of mean uh taking it like that and this uh i believe like through the the high hormone phase that luteal phase there's effect on 
uh, the ability of the individual for, for cooling because there's that blood plasma drop. Is that correct? Um, yes, and actually the metabolic rate rises. That's the, that's the point of the ovulation thermometer. The ovulation thermometer is a very sensitive type of thermometer, um, and it's sort of seen as a bit of an old-fashioned thing, but actually the reason you take the, your temperature and you know if you've ovulated because your temperature goes up, because progesterone is sort of a, like a catabolic hormone, so you're right about, and the fluid levels change and everything. Anyway, so your metabolic rate goes up. You do literally are warmer, right? So exactly, it's more uh, challenging to cool yourself down. Uh, and so that's why women sometimes say, oh, I can't sleep so well, because actually uh, they have to think ahead. Oh, fine. This is, for example, the way you would use that information. Oh, I know my metabolic rate is going to raise. So I've got to make sure, you know, sleeping in a well-ventilated room, blah, 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 blah. And if you're training, then you're going to make sure, you know, you're, you're staying well hydrated, you know, depending on the temperature, of course, you know, uh, you know some water and ice or whatever to keep yourself cool because then you just feel more comfortable. But also that raising metabolic rate is another reason why you can get hunger urges during that phase. You know, like I said, you know, you would just want to eat a bar of chocolate or something. Um, <laughs> but it's because, uh, listen, I've got nothing against chocolate, but probably not a whole bar at one sitting anyway. Um, but you know, it's because you can't control your blood sugar so well. And so actually, again, knowing about that in advance, so you can plan ahead and think, okay, fine, I need to make sure I'm packing more snacks when I go down to do my training or whatever. Uh, you see what I mean? So it's, it's, as I say, it's all planning ahead. It's just like you would plan ahead every other aspect of your training, wouldn't it? You would do a plan, you know, what, what's your route for your riding, you got loaded your route, and I don't know, all these other, whatever it is you're going to do, you would plan ahead, wouldn't you? You don't just, so it's the same principle. Of course. So if you're a female athlete performer in that high, you know, the high hormone phase, the, the luteal phase, your metabolic rate's going to be higher, going to be warmer. And so I'm thinking of a fuel-in point of view, you would be needing mm. to make sure your fuel, uh, your fuel-ins, as you said last time, uh, you shared from your colleague uh, from Team Sky, fuel for the work required. So yeah, exactly. So be- this includes, that's a very good point. I'm glad you, <laughs> exactly. I love that phase. So it's not literally just that, the training, but for you personally, as an individual, for a woman, for example, um, and especially with working with the dancers, um, because, um, I mean, I know everything's disrupted at the moment, but normally, you know, they have a whole day, they've got a company class, they've got rehearsal, they might even have an evening performance. Anyway, for them, it's quite challenging to stay topped up during the day with fuel, but especially, as you say, um, if you were in that luteal phase and your progesterone is high and your metabolic rate is high, then, you know, that's the sort of advice. It's like just, you know, uh, even when it doesn't, I'm not saying you eat more overall, but it's just the spacing of it. So, you know, the cereal bar, you would literally have a bite here, have a bite there, you know, you'd really keep on top of it so that you don't have this sudden urge, crave to go and eat the bar of chocolate, you see. I think you want a legion of fans when you, you've, you've given all the female listeners a reason why they can uh, crave chocolate, but you may have uh, ostracized the male chocolate lovers there, Dr. Nikki. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, listen, you guys don't have to go and, you know, you guys don't have to negotiate all of this. So, well, listen, the males as well, it's fine to eat a bit of chocolate, but for anybody, I think probably not a whole bar. Okay. So we'll leave it at that. Right. And, uh, and so, and Dr. Nicky, you're implementing this with, uh, Manchester United, uh, football, uh, Scottish ballet, as you said, and you know, for the, for the, the listener of the show who may not have access to a, a direct access with the frequency that you might be consulting with, you know, performers and athletes in that, in those professional settings, what advice might you give just to help make this really you know practical for them like is it a, a getting a series of blood tests done with uh, their general practitioner or well i think i think um the the hormone profiling is specific we've developed that um uh, with a company fourth edge in the uk so actually for the profiling and suffice to say it's complicated um lots of mathematical modeling and stuff so I think for from the blood test point of view, for if you're a female thinking, oh, this this sounds very interesting about the menstrual cycle and I want to look into it more, actually, I think, unless you live in the UK, if you live in the UK, get in touch with me and, and we can do the profiling. But I think just getting a one-off blood test or even two blood tests uh, with your general practitioner who won't have all the, you know, the technology that 
I'm employing probably not going to be helpful but but so if you haven't if you're not living in the UK and you can't do the blood test the profiling with us then um, just doing I mean most women anyway will be tracking their cycles I mean I'm very old as you can see so I just use pen and paper but you know and that's nothing by the way there's nothing wrong with pen and paper just to say okay um, so however you are tracking it currently um, just make a note for yourself match it up and lots of people are already if you're an athlete you're probably already got some sort of training thing where you're putting down some well-being scores or something like that so just try for yourself and have a look and see is there some is there a, some rhythmicity to this mm. is it that actually the days when I'm feeling not great is that always happening at a certain time in my cycle um, and then you can do that that homework that investigation for yourself I mean with uh, Scottish Valley we're also using um, a company called Athlete Monitoring that who were already being used to monitor the well-being um, injuries, you know, uh, like a, a, a platform to put everything on there. And, and I said, I said, hold on, how come you're tracking all this stuff, but there isn't anywhere for a woman to put menstrual cycles on? So, and that is the problem with a lot of the technology that's around, all the various monitoring things, which probably, dare I say, were designed by men and yes. haven't got the facility to add on that menstrual monitoring. So, um, if you're listening to this, that is one system that's already up and running uh, that you could use uh, with athlete monitoring. We've set it up so that you can put on uh, your menstrual cycle or it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be expensive. Mm. The old fashioned pen and paper or your own Excel spreadsheet. You know, I don't, I, I don't want people to think this is a barrier to doing this because, Oh, I haven't got this and that. It's like, listen, uh, you know, I'm sure as if you're a woman listening to this, you're already, putting it down somewhere yeah. so just do it yourself just correlate that record with your training load how you're feeling see if you can detect your anything patterns for yourself it might be that you're not you don't you don't listen if you haven't got any problems don't go looking for them if it's all fine then great and there are other reasons by the way why we don't always feel you know uh top notch aren't there <laughs> Yeah. There are other reasons, right? You know, and maybe we did stay up a bit late, maybe actually, whatever it is, you know, maybe we didn't feel correctly, maybe, I don't know, maybe we are ill. So, you know, there are lots of other things going on. But if uh, you see some sort of a trend relating with your cycles, then there you go. It's, it's pretty sort of straightforward to, as a starting point anyway, just as a starting point to see. And then, sure, if you want more detail, information explanation um you know recording systems then sure you can uh go into that it's it's interesting that you mentioned that it, it's certainly something i i've noted a, a lack of but obviously a a slight shift towards with what you like you just mentioned the athlete monitoring but all the different data collection uh yeah. etc there's just a, and as a, a sports physio often trying to assist athletes coming off the back of multiple bone stress injuries or whatever it may yeah. be it's just where's this information be, be being visible for the, the team around the athlete uh, or the performer? Uh, it's, yeah, so it's great to hear that there's minds like Yeah, that. and also I went round to quite a few of the, I won't name the names, but I went round to quite a few of the monitoring systems and said, oh, you know, can you add this on? And they kind of looked at me blankly. They were men, I'm sorry, men, but, you know. Anyway, looked at me blankly and it's like, why would you want to do that? isn't menstruation isn't that just about being for you know fertility it's like oh dear we've <laughs> got a problem right so but if if i if i get that response it's obviously that's not the right thing so so i was i was fortunate when i joined scottish valley as the medical advisor that fortunately they already had a system in place and fortunately the uh you know the person in charge of this system totally got it and he said, this is amazing. This is, of course, because he was using the system a lot for uh, monitoring injuries and, and things like this. And so, like you, he, he immediately understood it. He said, oh, yeah, I, I, that's a great idea. But even if he was thinking more of the injuries, but, of course, I was thinking more of the, you know, how you're feeling. But anyway, we were on the same wavelength. So um, that was, uh, so that's why I'm really delighted with Scottish Ballet. We have this 
very novel system um, that we they're monitoring everything and they're monitoring the cycles all in one place so I as the doctor uh, can look at it I suppose that's the other thing that you know um, who sees that because it is a slightly personal I, I think you could say but the thing is I suppose we're lucky it's a small company um, so it's me and the physio and the dancer themselves individual dancers obviously not everybody um, in the company can see uh, and so, and I can, so it's very, it's lovely for me as a doctor, uh, because especially as we can't move around much here, <laughs> and I'm in London and they're up in Scotland, I can just log on and see what's going on with each dancer uh, overall, and also for the, the, each individual female, where they are in their cycle, what are they saying, you know, how are they feeling today, and then I can easily contact them and, and we have a chat and, you know, what's going on and, oh, should we do the blood tests and things like this, so... You know, it, it's definitely um, possible uh, to do this, but if you haven't got access to all of these things uh, as an individual, Just I would encourage you to do it. You're listening to Dr. Nikki Kay, sports and dance endocrinologist on this and expert edition around all things hormones across our lifespan. Today's episode is brought to you by Endure IQ. If you're ready to step up and take control of your training and performance goals, be sure to check out Endure IQ. Whether you're an athlete or coach, Endure IQ aims to empower you with the knowledge, tools, and strategies to optimize your sport's performance. Founded by Dr. Dan Plews, who you may remember from Expert Edition 213, Heat Training and Acclimation for the Endurance Athlete. Endure IQ brings you online courses in the practical application of low carbohydrate, high fat training fundamentals and heat strategies. To get you started with Endure IQ, they've offered up 25 US dollars off any of their online Endure IQ courses. Simply use the coupon code BRADBEER, B-R-A-D-B-E-E-R at the checkout to redeem the offer. Information is useful, but knowing how to use it is powerful. Endure IQ, hitting the sweet spot of performance, health, and enjoyment. Visit endureiq.com. And remember, you'll be learning from one of endurance sports, great minds, and also great performers. Dr. Dan Plews set the age group record of a blistering 824 at the World Ironman Championships in Hawaii in 2018. Of course, today's episode is also brought to you by Pogo Physio's online award-winning telehealth consultations. If you are an endurance athlete struggling with a bone, tendon, or joint-related concern, then rest assured, no matter where you are in the world, you can access physiotherapy assistance from myself or any of the Pogo Physio team online. Simply jump over to pogophysio.com.au forward slash telehealth to get your rehabilitation journey towards your physio finish line started. For now, let's jump back with Dr. Nikki Kay on this week's expert edition, Hormone Health and Performance Part 2, Hormones Across the Lifespan. Dr. Nikki, uh, the female athlete heading into menopause, perimenopause, uh, menopause, your prior episode, you shared the phrase, you can get your hormones to work for you. So how does a master's female athlete get their hormones to work for them heading into menopause in this um, perimenopause period and then postmenopause? Mm. Well, having said that, oh, yes, you can get your hormones to work for you, unfortunately. <laughs> so this is an example where physiology is such that you can't overcome that. I mean, you know, that is what's going to happen. But again, again, accepting that, knowing that is normal physiology, that, you know, the ovaries do become less responsive. You know, they, they've, uh, they've got uh, for training over fatigue. It's like, no, we're not going to do this anymore, thanks. And so, the, so that's what the, the, what's the physiology is. The ovaries become less responsive to those controlled hormones, the FSH and LH driving them. And the ovaries, you know, don't produce the progesterone and estrogen in that beautiful uh, choreographed uh, cyclic fashion we were discussing. So that's what happens. So the perimenopause is the build-up to that because typically the, the ovaries don't just switch off. It's not just an on-off switch. Mm. So there's a sort of an intermediate stage where there's an intermittent fault, if you will. That's what perimenopausal is. Okay, that's what the perimenopause is. Can occur from any time from 40 onwards is typical when the ovaries aren't quite getting it right. And so there will be some cycles where the ovulation doesn't occur. So if ovulation doesn't occur, 
you won't get that big spike, you won't get the big spike either in estrogen or progesterone. So there's an imbalance between what your body's been seeing for the past 30, 40 years. So that's why you feel different, obviously, as a perimenopause. But again, it's all this thing about you're not going mad. This is a recognized physiological thing that happens. Your hormones become discoordinated and start to wind down. Uh, and it, it can be a very frustrating stage because, you know, I've been encouraging everyone to monitor how they're feeling during the menstrual cycle. But now suddenly it's a, it becomes a little bit what appears random. Uh, you know, it's just because of this intermittent thoughts occurring. So, but listen, if you're in the perimenopause, um, you know, uh, you're not going mad. This is what's happening. And in this situation, I would uh, actually, it would be helpful to do a blood test. We can't diagnose the perimenopause on a one-off blood test. Why? From the female hormone point of view, because it's an intermittent fault. You know how it is when something goes wrong and then you, with your car and you take to garage and nothing's, they can't find anything wrong with it. You know that, you know that one. It's a bit like that. Uh, so doing a one-off blood test won't give you the diagnosis, but it will <clears throat> maybe give some clues that things aren't quite up to speed. But also the most important thing, it will exclude other things. Because as we get older, uh, you know, we're more likely, unfortunately, as we get older, it's not always great. Um, <laughs> you know, you're more likely to get other, just from the age point of view, more likely to get things like an underactive thyroid, especially for a woman and other bits and pieces. And so a blood test actually, apart from, you know, uh, the perimenopause itself, you're going to exclude other things. There could be something else going on. Just make sure it's not an underactive thyroid. But equally, you know, you might pick it up. And this is also where a profile, if you're in the UK, can be useful because then I can see actually the hormones aren't quite doing what we would expect them to do. It does look like the ovary is getting a little bit sluggish. So that's what the perimenopause is. So, but again, it's just about being aware. Okay, fine. That's why I'm feeling so weird. And then the menopause is when the ovaries totally stop. You know, they don't respond anymore at all. And so the estrogen, that's when it really takes a nosedive. You know, all the symptoms that people have probably heard about the perimenopause, mm, control of your body temperature, hot flushes, you get weird times when you feel really hot, brain fog, um, mood changes, one minute you're really happy, next minute you're really sad. Uh, it's just, it's almost like a very extreme case of the pre-menopause, uh, the pre-menstrual syndrome. It's a very extreme case of that, where the temperature's all over the place, your mood is a bit, is, is a bit weird, you're just a bit... Not quite with it. What can I say? Just not feeling, not feeling great. Um, I've had an athlete the other day was talking to me, you know, just sort of vague aches and pains and just not up to training an endurance athlete. Um, and interestingly with her, the one-off blood test didn't diagnose it, but it certainly gave me hints that, and given her age, it's like, well, listen, I think this is perimenopause. First of all, knowing. I was like, phew, I'm not mad. I'm not, you know, this is what's happening to me. Uh, and then for women, there is the option of HRT, hormone replacement therapy, which basically replaces at a physiological level the estrogen and progesterone that you're not producing, uh, you know, so much of anymore. Um, and I know there's a lot of, and this probably would take a whole other discussion, uh, but suffice to say, there has been, I don't know how it is over there in Australia, but there has been a lot of bad press and frankly misinformed press about the risks of uh, HRT. But what I will just say is that I had the privilege of being at a lecture delivered by the Vice President Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology here in the UK at the end of last year. And sub subsequently she wrote a brilliant editorial and uh, she was very distressed that this mis uh, misreporting in the media about HRT, uh, you know, scare stories, it's true. If you take HRT, there is a slight increased risk of breast cancer. It is true. However, that is very small compared to a woman, woman who is not on HRT, but is overweight, not exercising, drinking and smoking. And her risk is actually six times higher of breast cancer. Uh, and actually HRT, uh, all cause mortality, all causes of death is reduced because it also gives you some cardiovascular protection. So it, it sounds, by the way, I haven't got shares in an HRT company, if you're wondering, no. But I'm just, put it, but I'm just speaking as a woman uh, who, is, who has looked at the facts and the evidence, just to say, 
So if you're a woman listening to this, please, it's every woman's individual choice and right to consider HRT. There will be some people for whom, sadly, it is contraindicated. If they have got a family history or a personal history of breast cancer, for example, I'm afraid it's off the table. But on the other hand, for those that are considering it, please look at the really reliable sources of information and make the choice for you and make it based on your quality of life. If you're suffering with all these problems and it's really, you can't train properly, it's just really interfering with your life, then I, you know, it's definitely worth uh, considering and, and, and trying at least. Um, but the sooner you make that decision, the better, because what is certain is that you're going to get the most benefits from it if you take it, you know, as soon as you reach the menopause or just, just on the cusp of the menopause, you know, uh, rather than uh, leaving it for many years afterwards, because then that's obviously you kind of miss the boat in that sense. And, and thinking about the listenership of this show, Dr. Nikki, uh, the individuals typically want to get the best out of themselves physically. So as you say, make the decision on your quality of life, whatever's important to you in that. Obviously. Yes, yes, exactly. It works. It can interfere, um, you know, with uh, even if you're not an athlete, your work, whatever that is, you just can't, function or you can't function as, as well as you would like and certainly from a training point of view I've seen quite a few perimenopause uh, athletes um, who have been struggling and simply just can't do the training they want to. I mean they should be, listen as we get older you should be modifying your training anyway but they can't even do something that they want you know to a certain level and so it's, they're just finding it very very frustrating um, and it is interfering with what they want to do and so that's when it's definitely worth at least considering looking at all the options and, and uh, you know, making an informed choice. Yeah, an informed choice. And before we speak about the males across the lifespan, Dr. Nikki mentioned uh, under, an underactive thyroid as a potential condition mm -hmm. to exclude uh, if you are in this perimenopausal phase, for example. Uh, could you briefly share the signs of what an individual may look out for? Yeah. By an underactive thyroid, I mean the, the gland itself is not producing the hormones. A bit like the ovaries getting a bit recalcitrant so, so the thyroid can happen. But I want to make a, uh, before we go any further, I want to make that clear distinction between when we spoke last time about REDS, relative energy deficiency in sport, and I said that everything gets downregulated, including the thyroid axis and the metabolic rate. So that's not the fault of the thyroid gland, by the way, in, in that situation. Low energy availability, everything gets switched off from the boss, the top downwards, okay? Mm -hmm. But in the primary underactive thyroid, the gland itself here in your neck is not producing enough hormones. As I say, it's in some ways it's similar to the ovaries. As you get older, it just becomes a little bit sluggish, literally. <laughs> okay, and so it won't produce so much of the thyroxine hormone. And so, yes, you literally feel sluggish. You just feel a bit tired, lethargic. It, and this is why it should be distinguished from perimenopause because it can interfere with your cycles, menstrual cycles, you see can actually make them longer and heavier, or it can basically make them irregular. So that's why it's important to exclude it, you see, that's why I'm thinking. But also, so this is why there's, there's many of the symptoms you might feel from that would be similar to perimenopause, which is why I think it's important to always exclude that. And that's what I always do. Just be absolutely sure that not, we're not dealing with something else, which is, can occur in that age group, especially women, uh, so just see what's going on there. No, that makes absolute sense. Thank you for clarifying. With the males, uh, let's talk to the male athlete performer, Dr. Nikki. Uh, one stat that I, I know I, I share often in uh, bone stress injury uh, presentations mm -hmm. is from Hackney and Lane in 2018, and their research finding was that there was a 30% reduction in testosterone levels in athletes mm -hmm. with at least five years of endurance running compared to athletes with fewer years of training. So one third less testosterone for five year plus endurance athletes, which if you're an mm. endurance athlete, it does tend to be a lifelong pursuit. So uh, mm. males don't get out of this uh, scot free either. No, <laughs> so, no, 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 yes, I don't want to be too discriminating here. Um, so that's uh, and that uh, I, I know that work, uh, you know, um, uh, Hackney's work. He's obviously been in the field, you know, doing really brilliant stuff for a long time. So that's great. So yes, it's very interesting. Um, Last time we said that reds can affect men as well, and we know that that can reduce the testosterone level. Again, 
when I say reduce it, like going back to this range, there's a range of all hormones. And so lower testosterone does not mean you have a medical condition. You're totally outside the range. It just means you're at the lower end. And that's also what I saw in my cycling study. The males that were under fueling, for sure, they were definitely lower, lower range. But equally, as in that paper, there's also the hypothesis that even if you're not, even if you have sufficient energy in the system, the test, like you said, just being an endurance athlete, putting your body under a lot of stress can slightly reduce it. But listen, I think the thing is that on the other hand, for bone stress, also, if you are an endurance athlete, um, and I'm thinking more like the triathlon and, and, you know, you are loading your skeleton as well, by the way, and doing strength and conditioning. So to a certain extent, it mitigates a little bit, you know, like the female, uh, like female rowers, it's, it's uh, loading the lumbar spine because they're rowing. That also mitigates any problems with the low bone density. So it's not all doom and gloom. Okay. But I do accept that it's something to consider. Um, and also it's true as you, uh, the males, uh, apart from any reduction due to or lower levels due to the training, uh, also there is the age factor and we know it goes down as well. Uh, in a similar sort of time scale, like 40, 50, it starts to go down. There's a different range. For example, there's a certain range for up to 50 of for testosterone, but after 50, then it's just the range is just a little bit shifted lower. Do you see what I mean? That's the normal range anyway. So guys, yes, I, I accept that your testosterone will be going down, but again, I say just bear in mind that for women, the range, the shift in estrogen is from here, it goes like really low. I'm not minimizing it, but I'm just saying. Mm, relatively, yeah, relatively. <laughs> just, and... just, just saying, just saying. Um, but for men, uh, you know, what do you do about it? For women, we said HRT. But for men, obviously, taking testosterone is a no-no because if you're competing, because it's on the band list, obviously. Um, but there are other ways of uh, supporting your testosterone levels um, and strength and conditioning, weight uh, exercise has been shown to help with testosterone and, of course, your protein intake. So you need the anabolic st stimulus of the type of training you're doing, strength and conditioning, and really that protein is, is very helpful to prevent. And why do, you, why do you want to boost your testosterone? I mean, apart from the obvious, but um, from, a, from an athlete point of view, um, you know, testosterone is an important hormone for driving adaptations um, and maintaining muscle mass uh, and hemoglobin levels. So, so that's why. And so, you know, that I think, you know, for all masters athletes, m men and women, um, my cycling coach son is always telling my husband who's a master cyclist to get down to the gym and he's his coach you see so he's meant to listen um so and and you know i don't know maybe it's just my husband but my husband hates the gym <laughs> because maybe he's of that generation when you didn't go to the gym but actually um it does make a difference if you do that uh, by the way this i should i should also listen to this advice you know going to the gym uh, is becomes more important part of your training schedule. Because, you know, we talked about those three things. You can influence training, nutrition, and recovery. And so for masters athletes, men and women, um, you know, it's also the nature of the training. And so actually, in, you know, factoring in strength and conditioning and factoring in more recovery. You do need more recovery because you haven't got those hormone levels that are going to back up those adaptations to change. So you want to give your body... Number one, the stimulus, the correct, a good stimulus, like the strength and conditioning, and also you want to give it, give it more time, uh, rest and recovery to try and do what it can. You're listening to Dr. Nikki K, part two, hormones, health and performance, hormones across the lifespan on this an expert edition. If you missed last week's episode, it was a featured performer episode with the highs, lows and many learnings from the queen of ultra running, Camille Heron. Here's a little snippet of my conversation with Camille. I have to constantly remind myself of this because when I when I start to get like uh, like I get too serious or too focused and uh, like going going too fast on my easy runs, um, I mean that that can sometimes take a toll on me and uh, you know and I have to remind myself okay slow it down 
go easy. And it's kind of amazing how if you just have that thought of running for stress relief, and um, that, that you relieve that stress, you feel less tension in your body. And, uh, and I, start to, I start to see a change in um, even like my sleep, like I start to sleep better, you know, if, if my body's less stressed. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing how, like if you just change your perspective for um, how you feel while you run and running for stress relief and taking it easy, that, how that impacts you. To enjoy the full episode featuring Camille, be sure to jump over to wherever it is that you enjoy your podcasts from, including now our YouTube channel, The Physical Performance Show. For now, let's jump back with the many learnings from this week's expert edition featuring Dr. Nikki Kay, part two, hormones, health and performance, this time exploring all things hormones across the lifespan. Dr. Nikki, uh, this is a big topic. And as you said, you could speak uh, on, for example, hormone replacement therapy just in a whole separate uh, mm-hmm. uh, episode, which we may have to uh, do down the track, <laughs> uh, your, your three-peat uh, on the show. But uh, I'm going to push you, uh, push you uh, cognitively here. If you could boil everything around this topic you've learned for your career to date, for the listener of this show out there trying to pursue and perform at their own physical best, around this concept of hormones across the lifespan, what would that one bit of advice be to the individual listening in? Well, exactly that. You are an individual. It's the first point. Do your own research, take everything on board, but everyone will be slightly different. Don't think, oh, because so-and-so is doing this, I should do exactly that. It might not be right for you. And you are an individual because although we all obviously have hardwired certain, you know, the physiology there, you know, uh, there are finer details with each of us individually with our hormones, like we said, the menstrual cycle. And also these hormones are changing over your lifespan. So, um, you know, if you're a 50 year old, of course you shouldn't be trying to train like your son or your daughter who's 20. (laughs) It's not going to, it's not going to end well for, I. you know what I mean? It's not going to end well. So, you know, just bear in mind that you have, your hormones are changing all the time from day to day, from week to week. So you have to, you know, factor in your training schedule, those three factors, but also over the lifespan, you are going to have to modify things because your hormones are different and you always want to be uh, giving your hormones the best possible chance they can to support you. So don't work against them. Please work with them. that's, uh, that's, That's powerful. And last uh, appearance on the show for the physical challenge of the week, you challenged, uh, <laughs> challenged people to do something outside of their normal routine. Oh, yeah. So for the, the run of the distance runner, it was go to a ballet class. And I know you threw that out there as, a, as an extreme uh, <laughs> memorable example. And, hey, it's, it's, uh, it's memorable. I've got to I con- wonder if everyone did that. <laughs> I've got to confess, I did not take, but I did think about it. And fellow UK uh, medical practitioner and colleague of yours, Dr. Emmett Mystery, a uh, sports mm-hmm. psychiatrist, oh, yeah. shared a very similar physical challenge, which was to do some, drop something from your rigid routine as becoming a yep. whole person. And so what though in 2020 is Dr. Nikki Kay's physical challenge going to be to listeners? Well, I, actually, I'm going to say, if you're not doing this already, do, some, do a different type of exercise because we've been saying about changing it around, Okay. So if you are someone that avoids the gym, give it a go if you can, or at least do some strength and conditioning at home or do something, all right? Something different, but ideally strength and conditioning. And also, by the way, do it to music. I've been recently rehabbing a, a, um, a, a, an ex ballet dancer who had a hip replacement, like me, I had two hip replacements, and we have been doing rehab uh, type stuff uh, and because she's a ballet dancer, actually, we did it to ballet music. But I've been finding uh, that much more enjoyable. The challenge is, because we've been going on about strength and conditioning, mm-hmm. do, some, do some sort of strength and conditioning if you're not already. Or if you are, try doing it to music, right? Because it's just music is like, it's almost like a hormone release thing, isn't it? It, you know, it's got a certain pattern to it, right? Mm -hmm. It's got a, you know, so many bars, blah, blah, blah. So it actually makes it very easy for repetitions. You do so many bars of doing this exercise, so many bars of that, and it gives it certain rhythms. So there you go. That's, that's, that's my challenge to you all. Do some strength and conditioning and try doing it uh, to music of your choice. It doesn't have to be classical, whatever you fancy, 
but it just gives it some more uh, rhythmicity to it, like hormones. There you go. Look at that. That's tied it all in, gone full circle. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely beautiful. Well done. <laughs> Dr. Nikki K, uh, you are, and we'll be tagging all of this up on the show notes because uh, the resources are many. Uh, your website's uh, still there, uh, NikkiKFitness.com, uh, which uh, I would encourage people to get across. You're still uh, well and truly entrenched with your work with the British Association of Sport and Exercise Medicine. Uh, and then as you mentioned, this hormone profiling work you're doing can be found uh, through there with Fourth Edge. Uh, so yeah. can, anywhere that people well, can go. Better find. people come direct to me for that if you're in the UK, okay? Because it's still at a research okay. stage at this point. And then the course for coaches, which was something that we'd connected on uh, off air, which uh, I just felt was a, an absolutely brilliant initiative, which was, is all about coaches working with female athletes across the different ages, a, mm-hmm. lo- a learning hub or a learning opportunity for them to uh, better understand uh, uh, energy availability, hormones, and this peer- integrated periodization, correct? Yeah, and the hormone profile and um, uh, this interest from some, uh, I think I can say sports. So there's a sports organization in Australia that's interested in this course, so, and you get a certificate of completion. So, yes, um, if you listen to this and you think, oh, wow, that's interesting, or I want to know more, or you're a coach and thinking, wow, I should probably get up to speed on this uh then yes i would recommend having a look at that course hopefully people will find that of, of use and benefit absolutely and i do i have seen a, a trend and you would be right across this as well which i think is brilliant where there is a greater conversation around around yeah. these uh these things there's growing awareness and uh and greater tools such as this great course for uh, equipping people with uh with the skills and information dr nikki k uh it's morning time uk there Uh, So thank you once again for your contribution to the Physical Performance Show. Cool. Listen, thanks so much. That's always uh, an absolute pleasure and uh, really exciting to always come and discuss with you. (laughs) Okay, ciao. So there you have it, another expert edition of the Physical Performance Show, and I trust and I know you enjoyed the learnings from Dr. Nikki K again today. If you did, then please reach out and let Dr. Nikki know what it was you enjoyed from the show. We will tag up all of Dr. Nikki's handles on our show notes page, and you'll find Dr. Nikki easily over on Instagram at Nikki K Fitness. That's N I C K Y K Fitness. F-I-T-N-E-S-S. And remember, it's K-K-E-A-Y. Now, be sure to reach out to Dr. Nikki K if you would like to take part in some of the hormone profiling that she mentioned. And Dr. Nikki has recently launched a fantastic online course to aid with the up knowledge and skilling, to aim with the upskilling and knowledge and practical strategies for coaches working with female athletes during puberty and beyond. The course is titled Working with High-Performing Female Athletes, brought to you by Sport Ready, and we will have the link in the show notes. So if you are a coach working with female athletes or a practitioner for that matter, or an endurance athlete or athlete wanting to learn more about optimizing female athletes, then be sure to check out that outstanding course, Working with High-Performing Female Athletes. Now, we're so excited to have launched the Physical Performance Show Learnings Membership and ongoing efforts to improve the quality of learnings for coaches, practitioners, and athletes worldwide. We've set up the Physical Performance Show's Learnings Membership with that in mind. It's real simple. If you'd like to support the production of the show, you can jump over to Patreon and become a patron of the show. It's patreon.com forward slash TPP show. And you can support the show for five US dollars a month. And as a way of saying thank Thank you will grant you access complimentary to all upcoming live stream events. Now in 2020, we've held two very popular, globally well-received live stream events with Dr. Shona Halson on all things recovery and Dr. Stephen Seiler on all things polarized training. And in 2021, we'll be set to continue the live stream events, normally ticketed at $49 per head. However, as a physical performance show patron for $5 US per month, you'll be granted full access complimentary. A massive thanks to those leaving ratings and reviews over on iTunes and also for those taking the podsies and tagging them up with the Physical Performance Show at Physical Performance Show on social media. We've also got the YouTube channel up and running, the Physical Performance Show. We'll be sharing mini snippets of the recordings as they go live. And of course, don't forget to hit subscribe if you are enjoying the show. 
If you have any feedback for the show, you can reach out and let me know directly on social media. You'll find me at Brad underscore beer on Instagram and Twitter. And if you'd like to follow what I'm up to in implementing the many learnings I take in recording and bringing this show to you with my training, then you can jump over to Strava and see my best efforts to implement all the learnings, including the sometimes challenging polarized training approach. You'll find me Brad Beer over on Strava. Now, massive thanks to those that make this show possible each and every week. Daryl Misson, our audio engineer, Susan Wilkin on all things show administration and Matthew Alden on all things show graphic design. Now, coming up on the Physical Performance Show, we'll keep the learnings coming for you. And I'll share a conversation with you that I recently had with Australian professional cyclist and Olympian Rachel Nalen. Rachel was a 2016 Rio Olympic Games representative and also secured a World Championships silver medal in 2012. Rachel has a great story around all things highs, lows and learnings of endurance sport. Following Rachel, we'll be catching up with Jessica Hull of Australia, who's been in the form of a life setting some blistering, long-standing Australian records on the track across the 1,500 metres, 3,000 metres and 5,000 metres. So be sure to be tuned in for the upcoming episodes of The Physical Performance Show. In the weeks ahead, I'm Brad Beer and this has been The Physical Performance Show.